India, despite its vast and ancient history, has seen very few women leaders. This isn't really surprising. Throughout human history, women have mostly been relegated to the sidelines. But not always. Meet the greatest queen India has ever produced, Rudra Devi, ruler of the Kakatiya dynasty. Rudra Devi isn't noteworthy just because she was a powerful woman in a world of men. She was a truly visionary leader, a reformer whose successes continue to have an impact today. It's about time we gave her story the attention it deserves. Rudra Devi's political ascendance can be traced back to 1259 CE, when she was made co-ruler of the Kakatiya dynasty alongside her father, the legendary Ganapati Deva. She was only 14 years old at the time. Around this time, she was also married off to Virabhadra, a minor prince of the eastern Chalukya lineage. These decisions were political chess moves. See, Rudra Devi's father was an ambitious king, and his reign was characterized by constant expansion. By 1259 CE, however, his southern borderlands became a problem. The Pandyas were a looming threat, and an invasion was imminent. Concerned that he did not have a male heir should he die while in campaign against the Pandyas, Ganapati Deva sought the wisdom of his Prime Minister. His Prime Minister advised him to make Rudra Devi his royal heir through a ritual process known as Putrika. Through the Putrika ceremony, a daughter could be legally transformed into a son. This was a necessary step for royal succession. Ganapati Deva agreed. He conducted the Putrika ceremony and Rudra Devi was given a male alter ego. There was finally an heir to the Kakatiya throne, a woman. All this was done to prepare for a worst-case scenario invasion. Ganapati Deva's cautious approach could not have come at a better time. The Pandya invasion was a disaster for the Kakatiyas, who suffered a nearly catastrophic defeat at the Battle of Mutukur. After the battle, Ganapati Deva eventually turned the tides of war, but he'd already lost significant territory. Many of his feudatories were now at risk of being swayed to the Pandya side. Shamed by the outcome and tired of public life, Ganapati Deva retired in 1261 CE, handing full control over to his 16-year-old daughter. But could Rudra Devi protect this now fragile kingdom? Absolutely. Rudra Devi proved more than capable against both internal and external threats, of which there were many. Take the Yadavas, for example. The Yadava king, Mahadeva, saw Rudra Devi's ascendance as a land-grabbing opportunity. According to the historical record, he believed that it would be easy to invade and subdue the Telugus as they were being led by a young woman. Mahadeva simply did not respect her abilities. This was a grave miscalculation. In 1263 CE, Rudra Devi not only repulsed the invasion, but pursued the retreating Yadava armies all the way back to their capital at Devagiri. After a bloody siege, Mahadeva agreed to pay tribute to Rudra Devi in the form of 10 million gold coins each of which were struck with Mahadeva's name next to the Kakatiya emblem to emphasize his submission. Unfortunately, life was about to get a lot more complicated for the Kakatiya queen. Tragedy struck in 1266 CE, an emotional year in which both her husband and father died. This was a truly distressing event for Rudra Devi, whose love for her husband ran deep, despite the fact that their marriage was initially a political one. She vowed to never remarry, despite having given birth to two daughters and no sons. The death of Rudra Devi's husband and father was not just a personal issue. Suddenly, the question of Rudra Devi's royal legitimacy became a source of civil unrest. Despite her attempts to limit the visibility of her gender in public life, for example, by dressing in traditionally male attire, some of her relatives simply could not accept the ruling authority of a woman. Rudra Devi's jealous cousins, Harihara and Murari, resented the fact that her father had not selected one of them to inherit the throne instead and so they launched a rebellion on the basis that her gender made her unfit for the position. But Rudra Devi was not alone. In fact, she was supported by several powerful allies, including the skilled tactician Gunnaganna Reddy, hailing from a family of renowned Telugu poets, and Jagani Deva, the feudatory in charge of the southern Nellore region. With their assistance, Rudra Devi quashed the rebellion and restored order. Then, in 1269 CE, she held a formal coronation ceremony, thus securing her position as the legitimate ruler of the Kakatiyas. Despite regular incursions by the Pandyas and the Gajapati of Orissa, Rudra Devi managed to not only defend her domains and maintain stability, but also improve upon the status quo in some truly impressive ways. 
See, the Kakatiya dynasty had accomplished something special. For the first time, it united the upland Telugu peoples of the dry interior with lowland Telugu peoples along the fertile coast. The interior country was cursed with red sandy earth and bedrock. As such, it was unsuitable for heavy agriculture except with copious supplies of water, and there wasn't much water to begin with. It was sparsely populated and known for its harsh, unconventional culture built by pastoralists, artisans, and peasant warriors. Meanwhile, the coast was prosperous and fertile. Its soil was dense with nutrients and its land abundant with natural water sources. It was densely populated and known for its more formal and civilized culture built by cultivators and priests. And that's where Rudhamadevi came in. She saw potential in reconfiguring these traditional inequities. She committed to long-term infrastructure improvements meant to expand the agricultural base of the kingdom and to populate the dry interior with settlers from the fertile coast. Rudhamadevi built irrigation facilities and water tanks in the form of artificial lakes, and she offered tax incentives to encourage people from the densely populated coast to migrate into the interior and help develop its communities. This rapidly urbanized many sparse and unproductive areas of her kingdom, transforming them into revenue-yielding economic centers. Trade networks blossomed. Records indicate that a significant amount of elite wealth was redistributed through local temple grants into land development, tank building, and business loans to artisans, agriculturalists, and merchants. Internal trade and migration also led to greater cultural exchange and an explosion in literary works. Many famous Telugu writers, playwrights, poets, and scholars were patronized by either the Kakatiya court or one of their feudatories. Even today, poetry from Rudramadevi's kingdom is performed at festivals throughout the modern Indian states of Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. But Rudramadevi didn't stop there. She also committed to establishing a meritocracy through the loosening of caste and nobility restrictions. Rudhamadevi's administration encouraged peasants to explore alternative career paths, and she famously awarded titles, lands, and administrative opportunities to those without any noble lineage whatsoever. For example, there are records showing that some low-born peasant soldiers were granted the title Nayaka, meaning military commander. During this time, we also see deed of adoption records in which high-caste merchants and artisans brought low-caste apprentices into their communities, giving them an opportunity to join powerful commercial guilds. Notably, temple grants during this period also indicate a substantial percentage of donations by women and other underrepresented members of society. What do these temple grants tell us? One, wealth was being generated by a diverse set of people. The commercial success of the Kakatiya dynasty was not only limited to the elite. Two, women, who in previous eras were prohibited from land ownership, had been given land ownership rights, as they were making land grants to temples on their own. So Rudramadevi deserves a lot of credit, but it's important to acknowledge the overall culture of medieval South India, because in many ways, it was the culture that enabled these reforms, and that enabled Rudramadevi to rule as a queen. In the 12th and 13th centuries in South India, the rise of the Virashaiva Lingayat movement completely changed the fabric of society. Lingayats were radically anti-establishment. This meant a number of different things. They strongly opposed traditional Hindu culture. They opposed Vedic scripture, ritual, and caste and the Brahmins sitting at the top. But they also opposed Jainism, which was the dominant religion of the Deccan elite in that era. Jain leaders complained about the rapid spread of the Virashaiva religion in the 12th and 13th centuries, describing it as violent and populist. In fact, there's evidence of forced conversions of Jains and Shivalinga graffiti stamped on the inner sanctums of their temples. Simply put, the Lingayats were extreme reformers committed to changing society through any means necessary. Prominent Lingayats took a stand against gender discrimination, describing men and women as equally capable and valuable. They promoted free public education, despised caste hierarchies, and popularized native South Indian traditions, such as seated burial, in open defiance of Vedic Hinduism. So, what did this all mean for Rudramadevi? By Rudramadevi's time, the Virashaiva religion had become a supremely influential force in South India. Vedic Hindu beliefs were no longer seen as the default, whether in matters of administration, community building, or gender norms. As a result, medieval South India was much more open to radical new ideas. The circumstances were never more perfect for a woman like Rudramadevi to come to the fore. During her reign, Rudramadevi completed the fortress at Warangal, the Kakatiya capital. It was a fitting accomplishment, as the fortress would come to symbolize the military focus of her later years. In 1273 CE, Rudramadevi's loyal feudatory in the Nellore region, Jaganideva, died, and his brother Ambadeva took over. 
We know that Ambadeva objected to Kakatiya rule, but it's unclear precisely when he decided to break away and declare independence. This new rebellion would have to be quashed. When it came to war, Rudhamadevi followed in her father's cautious footsteps. She knew that she could die while campaigning against Ambadeva, who had the support of the Yadavas and the Pandyas. As such, she designated her grandson, Prataparudra, as her heir. Rudhamadevi's battles with Ambadeva and his allies continued until 1289 CE, when she died in a military confrontation at Chandupatla. Interestingly, historians once believed that she died a natural death in 1295 CE, but newly discovered carvings show her engaged in battle, equipped with a sword and armor, with the god of death appearing opposite. Historians believe that this confirms her death in battle against Ambadeva at Chandupatla, attested to in the carvings and other inscriptional evidence. Rudhamadevi's life was undeniably eventful and impressive. Interestingly, the famed Italian traveler Marco Polo spent time in Warangal in 1289 CE, before her death. In his writings, he sang her praises. He wrote the following. The kingdom has been under the rule of a queen for some 40 years. She is a lady of much discretion, who for the great love she bore her husband would never marry another. I can assure you that during all that space of 40 years, she administered her realm well. She was a lover of justice, of equity, and of peace, and was more beloved by those of her kingdom than any lady or lord before. Following her death, Prataparudra ascended the Kakatiya throne in Warangal. He had served capably in his grandmother's administration, and was committed to avenging her death and restoring the might of the Kakatiyas. Prataparudra waged wars against the treacherous Ambadeva and finally regained control over the breakaway Nellor region in 1309 CE. But while Prataparudra was a beloved and effective ruler who continued his grandmother's reforms, he could not prevent the inevitable. The Kakatiya dynasty collapsed in 1323 CE, when the Delhi Sultanate finally captured Warangal after two decades of bloody attempts. If you'd like to learn more about the Delhi Sultanate's invasion of South India, and the birth of the Vijayanagar Empire, I encourage you to check out my video on that subject. 